clinical carcinogen city assessment of nitrosamines, uh, focusing mainly on the newly introduced CPC methodology by the regulatory agencies. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us. Uh, I'm Suman Chakravarti from Multicase, and I'll be introducing today's speakers and give a brief overview of the topics. Now, there will be two presentations today from two leading experts in the field. Uh, the first presentation is by Alejandra Trejo Martin from Gilead Sciences, who will talk about interesting case studies using the CPCA module of the QSAR Flex software released recently. Furthermore, she will talk about determination of alternative acceptable limits using surrogates. Uh, following this, Dr. Rustam Sarka from Multicase will present, primarily focusing on finding and using surrogates for establishing AI limits for nitrogenase. I believe you will find both topics to be highly informative, relevant, and useful. Uh, now let me introduce the two speakers. Alejandra Trejo Martin is a senior associate scientist in Gilead Sciences. She authors toxicological documentation and performs ICHM7 based QSAR assessments of impurities. She has extensive knowledge and expertise uh, in medicinal chemistry aspects of inflammation, cardiovascular and viral diseases. She has an MBA and Bachelor of Science in Chemical Pharmaceutical Biology. Uh, the next speaker, Dr. Rustam Sarkov, who is my colleague here in Multicase, is the president of Multicase since 2012 and is with Multicase since year 2000. His expertise includes cheminformatics, QSAR, and computational toxicology. Uh, he has a PhD from Kazan State University in Russia and have postdoctoral research experience in Polish Academy of Sciences and Case Western Reserve University in the USA. With that, let's start the presentations. Please note that these uh, presentations are pre-recorded. However, there will be a live Q&A session at the end and you will have access to various materials via handouts. Hello, I first want to thank Multicase for um, letting me participate in this webinar. I'm Alejandra Trejo Martin from Gilead Sciences, and I would want to share the CPCA prediction module and considerations for acceptable intakes for nitrosamine drug substance related impurities. As we know, the assessment and control of impurities in drug products is addressed in the ICHM7 guidelines. And controlling nitrosamine drug substance related impurities or NDSRIs have been a challenge for pharmaceutical industries. Uh, part of the reason is because there is a high prevalence of secondary amines uh, in pharmaceutical products. And there's a prevalence of low-level nitrite levels in excipients. Nitrosamines are part of the cohort of concern, and there is a lack of agreement on toxicology-based testing, for example, sensitivity of veins assay, to characterize the mutagenic carcinogenic risk of NDSRIs. And there's also a, con a lack of consistent derivation of acceptable intakes based on considerations of a structure activity relationships. Uh, but currently, the CPCA framework has been a significant improvement in the acceptable intake setting. Uh, the regulator authorities have published a carcinogenic potency categorization approach for CPCA framework and where the assignment of acceptable intakes are based on structural features of the nitrosamine and are expected to increase or decrease the carcinogenic potency. The acceptable intakes assigned range from 1500 nanogram per day to 18 nanogram per day or 26.5 nanogram per day in the US. 
And this calculation of potency score is based on the uh, alpha hydrogen score plus the activating and activating feature scores. So I'll show you an example of categorization based on the CTCA flowchart. And I'll use this nitroso-oliceridine to exemplify this. The CPCA is a, is a flowchart and this predicts the potency category. So in this example, the first question will be whether the nitrosamine have any hydrogens on its alpha carbons. In this case, it's yes. So the next question will be, does this nitrosamine have more than one alpha hydrogen on one or both sides of the n nitroso group? The, question, the answer is yes. So then we look at, does this nitrosamine have a tertiary alpha carbon? And the question, and the answer is no. So then you need to calculate the potency score. And you will go to different tables and these tables provide a list of activating and deactivating features. So in the first table, you will count the number of hydrogen atoms in each alpha carbon and the lowest count first and corresponding to alpha hydrogen score. So in this case, you can see that you have in each of the alpha carbons, two hydrogens, and that is corresponds to an alpha hydrogen score of one. Then you go to a different table to look at the list of deactivating features and associated scores. And looking at the structure, you can see that one of the deactivating features is that there's change of more than five consecutive non-hydrogen atoms, cyclic or acyclic, on both sides of the n nitroso group. Yeah. And here you can see that, that in each side you have um, consecutive non-hydrogen atoms. You will then go to another table where there's a list of activating features with associated scores. In this case, the one that um, is in the table that you can see is this uh, arrow group bonded to an alpha carbon, uh, which is like a benzylic or pseudo benzylic substituent on the n nitroso group. And this corresponding and deactivating feature of minus one. Then you will go back and then you will um, add all these potency scores and this will give you a potency category, a, a potency score of one, which will then correspond, if you look at this table, the potency score of uh, equal or less than one will correspond to a category one, which is an acceptable intake of 18 nanograms per day. So now I want to share my experience with the QSAR Flex CPCA. This, um, this module can derive the acceptable intake. And what it does is it implements the CPCA flowchart, calculates the potency scores, and provides the result of potency category and acceptable intake limit. Uh, for this example, the n nitroso if you were going to use the QSAR Flex module, you will see that um, it's giving you the acceptable intake of 18 or 26.5 nanogram per day. There is a detailed report that can be retrieved. Another of the advantages of the CPCA module is that you have the capability of upload multiple uh, NDSRIs. Uh, you can see here, three of them have been uploaded and then you can simultaneously uh, have the CPCA prediction with the acceptable limits in one table. And again, if you were going to click in each, you will have a detailed report available for each NDSRI. So, I'll go over the overview of the QSAR Flex CPCA report. Uh, in the first page, you will have the potency category with the acceptable uh, limit. And one 
feature that is very convenient is that it also gives you the recommended acceptable limit for specific regulatory agencies. So in here, you have 18 or 26, and it's specifying that the, uh, the US FDA recommends it 26.5, and the European Medicines Agencies is recommending the 18 nanogram per day. It also details the workflow uh, output from the CPCA report. So similar to the example that I show um, using the CPCA framework, it shows you how those, how is it answering the questions and it highlights uh, with the structure what the answer is. For example, here is the, does the nitrosamine have any hydrogen in its alpha carbon? And then you can see that the two hydrogens in each side of the nitros and nitrosamine are highlighted. Uh, does the nitrosamine have more than one alpha hydrogen on one of both sides of the nitrosal group? That's yes. And then does it have a, a tertiary alpha carbon? No. And then it goes into the potency score calculation and what the results are. It highlights the deactivating features and you can see similar to what I showed before, it's highlighting those uh, chains of consecutive non-hydrogen atoms and the score um, assigned for those deactivating features. It also shows the activating features. Again, it shows the alpha, that, the, that benzylic or pseudo-benzylic substitution. And then it shows you the final um, category and what are the values for that. The other thing that the CPCA report includes is that it provides surrogates with animal carcinogenicity data. And it has a similarity value, which is a function of common structural features between the query molecule and the surrogate and not trosamine. And it includes also how robust that carcinogenicity study is. And it's uh, highlighted with a star. So uh, three stars will be a very robust uh, study. Two is limited, but it's sufficient carcinogenicity study. And the one star is insufficient carcinogenicity data. So in here, the, you have two examples of two surrogates. And you can see the similarity in, uh, is included, as well as the TD50s for each. and it, tells you what is the robustness of the carcinogenicity study. And if it if you were going to predict the CPCA for this surrogate, it also gives you a value together with the alpha hydrogen counts and scores and the activating and deactivating features that could be used or were used to predict this CPCA value. Another uh, table that is provided in this report is if there are similar NDSRIs with regulatory ac uh, acceptable intake limits. And here you have some of them. And again, that, that similarity value is a function of those common structural features between the query and the NDSRI. Here there are uh, three NDSRIs. Um, that I included in this presentation, and it has the regulatory acceptable intake and also includes which uh, agency is giving this uh, acceptable intake. In these examples, you can see that the oleciridine is 26 by the USFDA, and these other two examples have uh, regulatory acceptable intakes from the Health Canada. Once again, you have like the predictive CPCA and the alpha hydrogen count and score, as well as the features that were taken into account to calculate the CPCA in the QSAR Flex module. So I want to show you two case studies and what or how you can use the information that you obtain with the um, reports to include in your um, expert review or thoughts about what the correct acceptable intake should be for your query molecule. The first one is this 
nitroso trifluoromethyl tetrahydro triazole pyrazine. Uh, if you calculate, uh, if you use the QSAR module, it will come up with a potency category of two, which is corresponding to acceptable intake of 100 nanograms per day. It also um, tells you that the FDA, US FDA, as well as Health Canada and the European medicine agencies have um, assigned a 37 nanogram per day uh, acceptable intake to this particular uh, NDSRI. Once again, it goes to show you what the count of alpha hydrogens uh, are uh, in the, uh, besides the N-nitrosamine. The deactivating features in this case is the, um, that it has a um, five or six member ring contribution of two. And the activating features is this uh, RL group bonded to an alpha carbon, which is a benzylic or pseudo benzylic substituent, and it corresponds to an activating feature of uh, activating feature of um, minus one. So it calculates the the potency score, and it comes with a potency category of two or acceptable intake of 100 nanogram per day. Looking at the surrogates uh, with carcinogenicity data, there are um, these surrogates include these uh, N-nitrosamines that are part of a uh, six-member six, six member cycle, and it provides the similarity um, score as well as a TD50 that in these examples. Uh, ranges from 0.15 to 0.92 milligram per kilogram per day. And it shows you the robustness of the carcinogenicity study, as well as if these, uh, if you were going to have these surrogates, uh, having calculated the CPCA, they will correspond to 100 nanogram per day acceptable intake. And once again, gives you the alpha hydrogen count score and the features that are deactivating and activating. There is also some similar NDSRIs with regulatory acceptable intakes. Uh, you have the exact kit, as I said, this has like a 37 nanogram per day, but there's also these uh, two examples that I showed here that have uh, similarity of 0.66, and they have a 400 um, nanogram per day assigned as the regulatory acceptable intake. The predicted uh, CPCA score will be 100 for the query molecule and 400 for the other ones, um, taking into account the activating and the activating features. So for this case, using the information that you have from um, the QSAR module, you will find out uh, that the regulatory agencies are already assigned an acceptable intake of 37 nanogram per day, that the CPCA evaluation results will uh, be uh, an will give you an acceptable intake of 100 nanogram per day, and that other similar NDSRIs that that have that N-nitrosamine contained within a six-member cycle will have regulatory limits of a 400 nanogram per day. So the difference in this case between those similar NDSRIs and the query pyrazine is that benzylic activating feature. Therefore, you could provide an expert review, and in that expert review, you could address the relevance of that benzylic activating feature that is contained within cyclic structures. A second case study is this N-nitrosotrasagilin. If you were going to run the CPCA, you will have an acceptable intake of 100 nanograms per day. Once again, the, the module will tell you that uh, all the regulatory agencies 
assign 100 nanograms per day for this um, racigilin. The report will show you that there is uh, two alpha hydrogens and one alpha hydrogen that is within a, a, a cyclic structure, that there is no alpha tertiary carbon, and therefore you should be uh, calculating the uh, potency score. In this case, there are no deactivating features that were identified. And the activating features is again this benzylic or pseudo benzylic uh, substitution on the N nitroso group that will give you a activating feature score of minus one. Taking everything into account, you will uh, this will result in a potency category two with an acceptable intake of 100 nanogram per day. The surrogates with carcinogenicity data. In this case, you can see that all of them have that n nitroso um, a feature contained within a, a cyclic structure. The TD50 is ranged from 0 0.09 to 11 milligram per kilogram per day. The existing carcinogenicity studies for these surrogates is uh, not very robust. There are some insufficient carcinogenicity data. And for in these cases, if you were going to calculate the CPCA, it will result in a 1500 a nanogram per day. Similar NDSRIs with regulatory acceptable um, limits um, have these, I, I, I included these two examples in with a similarity of one. And all of them have a regulatory acceptable intake of 100 nanograms per day, as well as this will be the result of the CPCA um, result in the QSAR module or the QSAR flex module. Um, so in this case, if you were going to summarize, you will see that all the regulatory agencies already assigned 100 nanograms per day for uh, N-nitroso rasagilin. A CPCA will give you the same result, 100 uh, nanograms per day. And the similar surrogates with the N-nitroso feature are part of a cyclic structure, unlike the N-nitroso rasagilin. And similar NDSRIs have regulatory limits of 100 nanograms per day. So the, this will give you a framework of what other data, if anything, you will need if you were going to uh, address this in, in, the, in an expert review. So to summarize, I think the QSER Flex is a practical tool to evaluate one or multiple NDSRIs to derive the potency category and acceptable intake uh, limit. It gives you an easy access to the recommended acceptable limits by the regulatory agencies. And a detailed report is available that includes a detailed workflow. It also provides surrogates with carcinogenicity data and carcinogenicity study robustness uh, in these surrogates, as well as similar NDSRIs with regulatory acceptable limits. And all these data can be used for you to um, have an, uh, an expert review or, or know what kind of data is available to, to uh, understand better your NDSRI. So I want to thank Joel Berkew and Suman Chakrabarti for their help understanding the QSAR module. And I want to thank you for your attention. And if there's any questions, I believe um, this can be addressed and, and we can uh, answer in, in the future communications. Hello everyone and uh, thank you for staying long enough to hear my presentation. I'm sure you enjoyed the excellent presentation by Alejandra, and you already know how easy it is 
to use a CPCA tool implemented within QSRFLEX, how clear the reports are, how everything is spelled out. And you even probably know that we also provide the information about surrogates with available uh, carcinogenicity data when we create the CPCA reports. Now question is, why do we need those surrogates? And that's what I'm going to be talking about. So let's see how those surrogates with the robust carcinogenicity data can help us to establish a meaningful, acceptable intakes for NDSRIs. We're going to be covering a few topics. Main, main of them probably would be, do we really need surrogates now? When we have such a simple tool, just run it and you get your answer. And if we still need them, how to get new data for surrogates? And you probably already heard about robust carcinogenicity data, so what are those? And finally, we will run through a few examples and maybe explain some rationale how to use those surrogates to establish alternative AIs. So the most important question is, you have your CPCA call, is that final? Apparently not necessarily. There are a few quotes from the regulatory guidances from one of the regulators, which clearly say about alternative approaches which exist. And they can be done using the read across of this is highlighted suitable surrogates, not every surrogate, suitable surrogate. And in addition to that, uh, the same guidance also mentions that AI limits can be calculated uh, with the use of surrogates with robust carcinogenicity data. Here we go with robust data again. And more than that, this particular agency, USFDA, recommends using these uh, five, yes, five surrogates for which they are available data for robust metrogenicity, carcinogenicity. So if your NDSRI happens to fit the structural profile of any of those five, you might be in good luck trying to override CPCA call. Um, additional regulatory agencies introduced some other surrogates, which also considered to be um, usable for these overrides. And plus, we identified some other things on our own, of which I will be talking a little bit later. So what is the um, current situation? How frequently those AIs established by CPCA were overwritten by the regulators? If you look into the, those documents which are cited on this slide, for example, USFDA update information, which was updated um, as recent as December 1st, 2023, there are three examples of surrogates, which were uh, not surrogates, NDSRIs, which were overwritten. Original CPCA predictions was class one, giving us 26.5 nanograms per day. And they were overwritten to 100 nanograms per day, which strictly speaking corresponds to CPCA class two. The structures of those ingesterized are listed here, and all of them were overwritten based on NNNK. Um, another uh, simple nitrosamine was used on two occasions by USFDA, at least that's how it was reported in the same document, that was NTHP. And some other uh, simple nitrosamines were used on multiple occasions by European medical agencies. And that is also references given on the same slide. So it is happening. Regulators are using reliable surrogate data on surrogates with uh, robust carcinogenicity data to override the theoretical CPCA call. How do we get data for those surrogates? Well, the classic gold mine of the data is very original database, carcinogenic, carcinogenic potency database by gold. Well, unfortunately, it's uh, not updated for quite a long time, but luckily it was taken care of by LASA Limited, and now we have freely available LASA Limited carcinogenic database, which was recently updated, by the way, in like last month of uh, the previous year can be accessible by this link, which is listed on this slide. But there is another opinion that it's good to have those databases in hands. These are very useful. They have a lot of information, very easy to access. But what if you need to have some chemicals which are not there yet? There is a chance that these chemicals are out there in the literature. 
And there is opinion which was expressed in um, Joel Berko's paper that it's important to review the literature beyond LASER database. There are studies which are out there, maybe in a different language than English, maybe not exactly in a very suitable format for being data mined and being included in those early versions of databases, but they're still there. And if you're able to find it, you might have very useful contribution to your assessment. Example of this data is, for example, this paper by Drockery, which we identified maybe one year ago, maybe longer than that. The difficulty with this paper first, it is in German, and it's 100 page long. Uh, luckily, since so God for artificial intelligence, we were able to translate it to English. Another difficulty is um, there is no single mentioning of TD50. There were different units, maybe actual for that time for 60s, which were D50 and T50, those which produces 50% of cancer and time which needed to produce 50% of cancers. Plus, there were detailed descriptions of experiments for every of these 65 nitrosamines which were described in this paper. Overall, it's an excellent paper. It's kind of encyclopedia of carcinogenicity for those chemicals. And um, all these studies were performed by the same group of scientists over a couple of years and finally published. What we did, after we reviewed all these papers and we collected all the information which we could, we calculated TD50 values ourselves using the techniques and script provided in the Treasure's famous paper, which is listed on this slide. And we mostly collected such factors as experimental duration, number of animals with cancers, and of course, total number of animals. And for this particular diisopropyl nitrosamine, for example, we collect, collected those data which are listed um, here in this table we were able to plug them into that script, run the script, and we got this value, which is reported on this slide. So this can be done pretty much for every paper. So we, right now with this script, we don't depend on so heavily on TD50 values calculated or not calculated by those authors. As long as we have this piece of information, duration, number of animals with cancers, we able to calculate our own TD50. As you can see, this study is not extremely robust. And talking about robustness, how do I know that? We adopted the um, suggestions by Joel Berkus paper of three levels of robustness, robust, limited, but sufficient, and insufficient, where the most important criteria would be number of groups, those groups which were used, how many animals uh, per dose, per sex were used, daily dosing, long duration of administration, et cetera. When you have imperfection in one of those, less than three dose group or less than 50 animals, then it's maybe not so robust. And when you have just single dose or very short exposure or single sex or fewer than 20 animals, this is not robust at all. From our um, review of surrogates, simple nitrosamines, which were used by regulators to override calculated CPC uh, values, we kind of came to an idea that certain criteria are not so important. For example, such criteria as single sex, or when 50, less than 50 animals per dose are used, it will not affect the robustness of the study if more than three dose groups are used. For example, for NPIP, only 12 animals per dose group were used, but there were 15 dose groups. So it's very solid study, and it was considered as robust even if it, strictly speaking, does not fit the criteria of robustness. Using all this information, using our internal database, and using the almost 8,000 potential NDSRIs, which were published in the famous Schlindemann's paper, in the nitrosamine landscape paper, we identify overall 10 uh, robust, uh, robust surrogates. Those includes, including those which were reported by, or in the use by regulators, all, all regulators, um, SFDA, EMA, et cetera. And we also found, I believe, one or two which seem to be robust according to those Angel Berkus criteria, but not used by regulators yet. And we, for each of those almost 8,000 NDSRIs, we tried to identify the uh, proper surrogate with um, reliable data. And we 
consider only those surrogates which had robust cross synchronicity data and structural features uh, defined by CPC, which include uh, hydrogen counts, activating, deactivating features, etc. They should be exactly the same. We have a methodology of doing that in fairly quick and effective ways, some special fingerprint. So, and as you could see from the Alejandro's presentation, uh, those surrogates were selected and presented in every report based on those criteria. So when we calculated all the statistics, we identified that only category one actually benefits from that. Almost 49% of those category one's predictions can be overwritten to something less potent, to mostly to category two. Uh, rest of the categories, they have some kind of very minor percentage of chemicals overwritten, almost in statistical deviation. And we also observed that not all of the reliable surrogates were used or were suitable for this particular group of NDSRIs and most frequently used were NNNK, NTHP, and NMPA. Um, I have to mention that uh, NMPA was not considered as a reliable surrogate by all um, regulatory agencies, but since it was reported at least by one, we considered that one as well. How it is done? If I will use as an example this nitrosyl duloxetin, which I reported a couple of slides above, you can see that when we test it with a CPC model QSR flex, you can see it, it's identified that it is already it already has this regularly established AIs equal to 100 nanograms per day by all three regulatory agencies, uh, despite of the fact that it's actually calculated as category one. It also reports that there is a reliable surrogate, which is NNK, with established TD50, considered to be robust enough, which is almost 0 0.1 mg per kilo, per kilo per day. And if you will look into the presented pictures, it's really suitable because if you look into hydrogen counts, we have exactly the same situation. It is highlighted in the red um, color in this picture, in this diagram in the upper corner. And below that, when I show the NNNK, which was used as a reliable surrogate, we have exactly the same hydrogen situation on alpha carbons. We have exactly the same situation on beta carbon. We have a complete lack of deactivating features or activating features. And Whatever is attached to our beta carbon, neither here or in our query compound, it's not considered as um, a activating or deactivating feature. So, strictly speaking, we have an exact match from the point of view CPCA uh, features. From this point of view, uh, NNK really is very uh, suitable surrogate to override the CPCA call. Can we use the same logic for something else? For example, for this chemical, yeah, I guess we can. We have exactly the same situation. We have identical hydrogen counts. We have no deactivating, no activating features. We have something sitting attaching to the beta uh, carbon in our query compound, which is not recognized neither by activating, deactivating. And so happened to be that this is category one, and it has probably calculated value assigned by European medical agency, but nothing else. But using the same logic as it was done for the first compound, I would say that we might use this case, NNNK, to override the call, the original call, and make it 100 uh, NG per day, or effectively, it would be category two. Well, and here, and, and as an example, when we use the same technique, but for different categories, apparently, category two can be uh, modified slightly too. We use this particular chemical, and here we have a little bit more complex situation. We have, again, identified and more as a proper surrogate. We actually have one regularly established limit, which is 127 uh, NG per day, which is more than 100 NG per day, which is supposed to be for category two. So this and more, I guess, was used to establish this. Now let's see why it is suitable. We have identical hydrogen counts, we have identical deactivating features, which were found in both in query compound here, listed here, and in blue in this, in the lower part of the slide, and we don't have any activating features. So from this point of view, this surrogate might be uh, considered as suitable, and its um, AI 
can be used instead of calculated CPCA uh, category two. So we slightly um, downgrade the um, value from 100 ng to 127 ng. Can we use something else to make our life slightly easier? What we did for quite some time from the beginning of this nitrosamine saga is we use scaling based on molecular weight. And apparently it's, um, this idea was also published, uh, at least from what I know already twice. It was mentioned in Nudelman's paper and it was mentioned in one of the recent paper by the folks from the Lassen. It's all based on the assumption that um, the way how nitrosamine acts, reacts with DNA, it's actually a molecular event. One nitrosamine, if properly activated, will act with one uh, base in DNA, which was one active mutation. And obviously one gram of, uh, for example, NDA and one gram of um, nitros isopropanol will contain very different number of active or potentially active molecules. From this point of view, the AI limit, which is derived on a low molecule um, nitrosamine, cannot be or should not, should not be applied to large NDSRI without adjustment for molecular weight. If we apply this principle to those chemicals which we already um, illustrated, and let's start with just simple generic NDSRI with a regular, regular molecule weight around 400 Dalton, and it would be calculated to CPCA category one, which means it's pretty much based on the NDA. If we use this simple formula to recalculate, to adjust for molecular weight, we actually end up with almost 100 NG per day instead of 26. That's a big change. And for those um, NGSRIs, which I illustrated in my previous slides, those 100 uh, NG per day and 127, 127 NG per day actually turns into higher value and much higher for the last things. And finally, as an additional consideration, you might want to check our recent paper, which actually describes how frequently the confidence score of CPCA can help you to tell if you should override the CPCA call, or maybe you shouldn't. When the confidence score of particular CPCA call is very high, I guess you have to take it as it is. If it's not, maybe there is a chance to override, depending on what kind of surrogates you have available. So as a conclusion, while there is a light in the end of the tunnel, and we hope that this is not light coming from the upcoming train, there is a tool which is very useful, which can be used very easily and understood very easily. There is a way to enhance results from this tool, but we're still not out of nitrosamine woods yet because we anticipate that there will be a lot of changes in the main tool. There will be a lot of additional data about surrogates, about overrides, about frequently established limits. So the situation is flexible. However, the properly performed expert review can help in deriving the scientifically justified AI values for nitrosamines and can really help in any way. And uh, this will conclude my presentation. And to get the answers to your questions, please ask them now or forward them to this email. And I must mention that this presentation, this project would not be possible with help from my colleagues, Dr. Suman Chakravarti and Monika Jirilevi. With this, I can conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, those are two excellent presentations by Alejandra Trejo Martin and Dr. Rusam Sakov. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I really like both of them. Um, and I believe that uh, it would be very informative, informative and helpful for you too. Now, there are a few other things that I would like to mention here that uh, in multi-case, we uh, regularly perform very interesting research and we also publish from time to time uh, publications or papers that we feel uh, increases our understanding of the subject matter and they are also interesting. So in that respect, uh, we just published one paper a few days back, literally, and that is based, as Arista mentioned, um, for calculating confidence scores 
for the predictions that are coming out of the CPCA methodology. So that's one of the papers that you might want to check out. And the link that I uh, wrote at the bottom of the slide uh, would, would let you download this paper uh, as, uh, you know, for free. And the second paper we published uh, um, in the 2023, that was also uh, quite important for us. And we have used uh, this paper for, for helping our understanding of this whole problem. And that paper pertains to the prediction of uh, alpha hydroxylation of n nitrosamines and how can we use much more available data that is uh, present from the nitrosamine area uh, to calculate this alpha hydroxylation potential. So these are the two papers that was just recently published from us. And uh, if you can have a chance or if you are interested, please look at them. All right. And the next slide, I would like to give a little bit of uh, uh, a highlight of our upcoming participation in SOT in Salt Lake City um, in US in the US uh, in the March uh, of 10 to 14 to 2024. So we will do many different things in there, uh, but uh, the main um, event would be an exhibitor hosted session where uh, we will highlight different types of uh, issues or uh, tools that we develop for nitrosamine uh, problem. And uh, then we also have two posters. One of them is directly related to nitrosamine uh, that uh, Rustam already talked in his slides a uh, few, few minutes ago. And there'll be another poster that, were, that will be based on uh, the evaluation of rodent carcinogenicity using QSART uh, models that we have. And our boost number is 1207. So if you are going to SOT, uh, please stop by and have a little chat with us and we'd love to see you there. So with that, uh, I conclude uh, my slides. Thank you very much for everything. So I guess now we are going to go to the uh, question and answer session. So please stay put and let's have some question and answers. Thank you.